We, we are sparse, and I think Dr. Halverson is lonely up front. And a lonely president is, no one wants to have a lonely president, so can we kind of do this and come, come love Dr. Halverson. Look at that, that's present, that's love. <laughs> I'm, I'm. Oh yeah, this is good. So I don't, I don't know how many of you had the have had the opportunity to meet Dr. Kim, uh, but it's been really a blessing to have him here on campus to start to get to know him a little bit and to uh, see his uh, passion for the Lord and for missions. So, uh, please give a uh, robust, if small, welcome to the director of the PCA's Mission to the World, Dr. Lloyd Kim. Good morning. How are you all doing? So uh, last night I had dinner here at the Great Hall and I was sitting with a bunch of guys and they were talking about their intramural soccer match uh, last night. He said, yeah, you want to come watch? I said, sure, no problem. Uh, he said, it was at 7.30. I said, you guys, you guys have a shot to win the, there they are, the playoffs. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I said, what's your team name? And he said, 2C men, right? 2C men? 2C guys? So, you know, I was expecting to see this great match, and sure enough, it was great, but by the time I left, it was 4-1, and they were losing. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, we're all about grace, right? <laughs> um, I'm going to share with you a, a, a passage that comes from Matthew chapter 6. It's a familiar passage. It's um, part of the Lord's Prayer. And so I'll, uh, I'll read from verse 5 and end at verse 10. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Uh, we were doing our family devotions one night, and we often pray the Lord's Prayer, and it was my turn to pray the Lord's Prayer. And I was telling myself very deliberately, don't just rush through it. Try and articulate every word. Try and speak the prayer very thoughtfully, meditatively. Your kids are watching. You know, they're, they're um, your first disciples. And so I started praying the Lord's Prayer, um, and I got to about the third phrase, and there was a pause. My mind blanked. I forgot the next line. The kids started giggling, and after I finally rushed through it and said amen, they, they started saying, good job, pastor, <laughs> missionary, coordinator, don't even know the Lord's Prayer. Now, I always thought it was ironic that Jesus teaches us to pray this prayer and to pray it not repetitiously or mindlessly, but how do, we, how do we pray it? You know, let's be honest. I mean, we rush through it because we've memorized it. Well, the passage that I read comes in the context of Jesus' disciples um, asking him how to pray. And, and after teaching them how not to pray, he gives them this model prayer. But here's the thing. Um, he doesn't want us simply to recite this prayer mindlessly. But he wants us to adopt the world view, the set of values, and the kingdom perspective that this prayer assumes. 
it's this perspective that first helps shape our sense of purpose and direction in life. I know this is a stage of your life when you're thinking about future purpose, direction. Um, but it also helps inform our collective understanding of the call that we all have to God's great commission. And so today we'll just be, we're going to just look at the first three phrases of this prayer, um, our Father in heaven. It's the first, second, hallowed be your name. And finally, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is the first thing we pray? Our Father. Our Father in heaven. What is presupposed is that we have a relationship with God as Father. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus speaks against whom? And um, we read the passage. Who's he speaking against? The hypocrites, right? The scribes, the Pharisees, he calls them hypocrites. What was their problem? They didn't have a genuine relationship with God. Even though they were religious, even though um, they knew how to pray these wonderful prayers, their religion didn't go beyond their culture. They were just acting as if they really knew God, but they didn't. And so what we must recognize before anything else is the fact that we cannot engage in any meaningful way with mission, or for that matter, have any real peace or joy in our heart or life unless we have a relationship with God as, as our Father. Much of our striving in life, whether we're conscious of it or not, is really a striving to reconnect with the one who has made us, our creator. And so this prayer assumes that we have a relationship with God as father. I know this is a Christian school, but um, I will not assume that everyone here feels close to God as their father. Having a genuine relationship with God as father is different from growing up in the church I know many of you probably have grown up in the church, knowing the right answers or even saying the sinner's prayer. Having an authentic relationship with God comes when the Holy Spirit changes us, changes our hearts, changes us from within. It's a spirit that convicts us of sins. It's a spirit that leads us to repentance and faith. It's a spirit that helps us make sense of the Bible. Fills us with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's the Spirit that enables us to cry out to God, what? Abba. <laughs> Abba, Father. By the Spirit, we know that we are the children of God. One of Ernest Hemingway's short stories tells of this Spanish father and he decides to reconcile with his, his wayward son who ran away to Madrid. He didn't know how to get in touch with his son. And so the father takes out an ad in, in the newspaper, the El Liberal, and he writes in that ad this simple statement, uh, Paco, it's his son's name. Uh, Meet me at Hotel Montaña, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven. Papa. Uh, well, Paco is a common name in Spain. And so when the father came to the square, he found 800 young men <laughs> named Paco uh, waiting for their fathers. Hemingway strikes a chord in our hearts with this story. Um, why? What child doesn't want to be reconciled with his father? What child doesn't want to be in a good relationship with his dad or her dad? Now, if this is true with our earthly fathers, how much more true is it with our heavenly father? And so you see, all of our prayers and all of our religion is worthless if we don't have a genuine relationship with God. And so if you feel estranged from God, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Don't wait another day. Turn to him in faith. Turn to him in repentance. Our Father calls to us to come to him. And he writes to us in the gospel. 
All is forgiven. Love, Papa. The second phrase assumes that our life purpose is not to hallow our name, but to hallow God's name. You see, it's not about our reputation. It's not about our glory, but it's about his. The Pharisees and scribes prayed in order to be seen by whom? Seen by men, right? They wanted others to speak well of them. They wanted others to hallow or give worth to their name. But Jesus tells us that our orientation in life as the children of God is not to hallow our name, but to hallow his. So we exist to honor, to glorify, to build up the name of God rather than our own. But this is much harder than, uh, than it sounds, is it not? I was at a conference earlier this year on the West Coast in sunny San Diego. And San Diego holds a very dear place um, in my life, in my family's life. It's where I dated my wife, uh, where we got married, where we had our first kids, where I served in our presbytery, uh, went to seminary there. Uh, my wife went to medical school there. We were known. And so um, after coming recently into this position, I thought to myself, finally, I'm going to a, a place where people will know my name, right? So I go to the conference. This is an MTW conference, by the way. And I go to sign in to register, and they ask, well, what's your name? I said, well, my name's Lloyd Kim. Surely expecting they'd know that. At least I was a speaker. But uh, they had no idea. Just cross my name off and hand me the packet. Um, after uh, a time of worship, I went to the worship leader, and I said, you know, thank you so much for leading us. It was such a blessing. And uh, the leader said, oh, thank you. And, and uh, what's your role around here? just a speaker, you know, kind of coordinate things for a mission in the world. Finally, the last day, I was running late. I didn't have my name tag, and so I was trying to get into the, the uh, sanctuary, and they stopped me at the door, and they said, did you register? They thought I was trying to sneak in. Uh, needless to say, God was telling me something about my own preoccupation with my, my name. Jesus teaches us to pray, hallowed be your name. How often do we live the prayer, hallowed be my name? But you see, this phrase also has a very strong missions thrust. For we are asking, when we pray this prayer, that God would make his name hallowed. So the reason that we send, the reason that we go, is because the nations, many of them, are not yet hallowing the name of our God. And so we pray that all those who don't know the name of God, from every tribe, from every tongue, and from every nation, would come to know him as Father and would hallow his name. The final phrase we'll discuss today is, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. What would be the opposite? My kingdom come, right? Right? My will be done. Jesus was speaking against those um, who would pray repetitiously. And why would they pray repetitiously? They thought they, if they prayed enough or long enough or um, often enough that God would hear them for their many words. What were they trying to do? They were trying to manipulate God to do what they wanted, right? They are trying to manipulate God to perform their will. Uh, but you see, our Lord is calling us to orient our life away from our own personal agenda and kingdom toward his. It's what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple. People have often asked me, uh, Lloyd, what is your vision? What's your vision for mission to the world? My response has been quite simple. It's, it's Jesus' vision. What did, the, what did our Lord want to see? When he came to preach, what did he preach? Repent for the, the kingdom of God is at hand. How does he teach us to pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' vision was to see God's rule and his reign extend to the ends of the earth. He wants to see the heavenly kingdom come. This isn't simply a prayer for the second coming, which we certainly desire, but a prayer that the power and the presence of God would be known here on earth as it is in heaven. Let's flesh that out a little bit. 
what does this kingdom look like? In any kingdom, you need, you need people, you need citizens. And so when a person repents and believes in the gospel, submits himself or herself to the king, the kingdom of God advances. And when his church lives out the ethics of the kingdom, this comes in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, chock full of the ethics of the kingdom, when his church submits to the will of the Father, then God's rule and reign are here on earth as it is in heaven. And when those from every tribe, tongue, and nation worship the Father, the kingdom of God has come. And so here we have it, the vision of our Lord. The question we need to ask today is, is this our vision as well? Um, after a speaking event, a young college student came up to me and, uh, you know, she thanked me for the message and then she went on to share how, how her mother had passed away uh, just a month before. Uh, she started crying, weeping. She said it was an accident, something that could have easily been prevented. And then she went on to share that um, just a few months earlier, she gave her life to follow Jesus and she, she couldn't understand why God would take away her mother from her. But then she said, but now I realize that um, he wants everything and I'm okay with it. And I looked at her and I said, uh, your faith and your submission to God's will demonstrates his rule and his reign in your life. You are showing me a picture of the kingdom of God. Thank you for strengthening my faith. Our Lord teaches us to pray that God's will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there are no tears. In heaven, there is no sorrow. There's no injustice. There's no corruption. There's no abuse. There's no brokenness. There's no sin and there is no death. And so when we pray this prayer, what are we praying? We are praying that Satan's kingdom would be destroyed. We are praying that the gospel would go forth throughout the world. We are praying that his church would grow in grace and holiness, that people lost would find hope, that marriages that are broken would be mended, that children who are estranged from their parents would be reconciled. We are praying that Christ's reign would extend to every inch of this globe and that he would return in glory. Jesus teaches us to pray this way because this is how he himself prays. He says, our Father, our Father. He considers us his brothers and his sisters. He prays, hallowed be thy name, while his own name was ridiculed and mocked. He prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done and then submits to the will of the Father, even to the cross, to establish the kingdom. Remember how he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet not my will be done, but thine. What did it mean for Jesus to pray this kingdom prayer? It meant that he would willingly give, sacrifice, and submit to the king. Submit to the suffering and the pain of the cross that he would give up everything for the sake of the kingdom. Beloved, he calls us to do the same. So what then are the implications of this kingdom prayer? The implications are that we would live wholeheartedly for the kingdom, that we would submit to our king that we would seek to advance his will and his name above all else. This is where missions comes in. Our great commission mandate to go is the means by which the kingdom advances. And so if we want to see this vision of our Lord come about, we need to take seriously our mission, both in sending but also in going. 
in bringing the good news of the kingdom to the world. And so every person who says, sign me up, I'm going. Every person who is sent by our churches and prayed for testifies that the kingdom of God is real. You see, it doesn't make any sense to pack up all your things and to go somewhere else. It declares to a world that we submit to a living king who even now rules over heaven and earth. And it bears witness that the kingdom of God has come and we seek its advancement here on earth. So let me just end with this. What is your vision? May our collective vision be that the nations would call upon God as Father, that they would hallow his name, and that indeed his kingdom would come and his will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your amazing, wonderful grace to us. We don't deserve to be called your children, but you have called us to be the children of God. Help us, O oh Lord, as we pray this prayer week in, week out, to remember the kingdom perspective that you have for us. May our vision be your vision. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.